it's that time of year again, costume symposium. So you know what that means. Time to make another project I can accessorize with a knife. This is a prop knife. I want to be very clear, it's not sharp in any dimension. Okay. So a while ago, I got to thinking about the fact that clothing is kind of our first line of defense when it comes to environmental factors. Our ancestors knew this well because they didn't have completely controlled indoor climates like many of us do. And one of the few ways we still think of clothing as protection now is winter coats. Well, if a winter coat is kind of like armor against the cold, a gambeson is kind of like armor against arrows and other pointy things. So I started thinking the two of these could somehow be meshed together. A gambeson is basically a padded sort of jacket or doublet that would go usually under armor, but if you were a poor member of society, not a wealthy knight or noble, it might be your only form of protection. You might also wear it by itself during training. Most people don't think about textile armor much because, let's be honest, chainmail and plate armor is kind of more cool and exciting, but a padded jacket could be both your first and last line of defense against bodily harm. And similarly to a modern winter jacket, it usually had some quilting or padding to help reinforce it. So I took that idea and looked at several images of gambeson jackets historically that still exist and decided to design my own based on that idea. Now this kind of garment was used across many cultures across honestly thousands of years so I'm just using the term gambeson but there are other terms that describe the same item or something quite similar so for me this it was easier to just narrow it down to a key term that I could use for research and so that's the catch-all I'm using in this video but yes there are lots of other words you can use to describe something quite similar and those are all perfectly valid as well. Have you ever been laying in bed struggling to fall asleep when a haunting realization comes upon you um, and that realization is that you really really messed up the pattern you're drafting but fortunately it's not too late um, that was me last night so I'm gonna take a few minutes before I have to leave to meet some friends this evening to redraft this so basically when i took my chest circumference measurement i added a couple inches to it because this is going to be an outer jacket i wanted to have some um you know space so that i am able to wear sweaters and things underneath it um, and also to give that sort of air gap around the body that can help insulate it um so since I was looking at doing two front panels, one back panel, each front panel should be approximately a quarter of the total circumference, right? I started drafting it with each front panel as half the total circumference, so I would have ended up with a very large jacket. Um, so yes, while I was drafting I was like, hmm, this is taking up a big piece of paper because I always use the same size drafting paper. Um, so I was like, huh, this is like filling the paper more than it should be. Well, that's why. Um, so we're gonna fix this. It's not too late. To be honest, I, this pattern has challenged me in terms of its style, since this is obviously supposed to be a more masculine style garment. I'm not cutting it with sort of the usual curves and tightness. And since I am making this to be a looser fitting garment that has room to layer underneath it, it's gonna be a little bit boxy. Now I ended up changing my pattern a little bit to doing quadrants. So the torso I simplified, it's a basic torso block that will be cut into four identical pieces just mirrored on the opposite side so the back ended up being two pieces as well. I also am using this 100% cotton quilt batting as my stuffing. Now 
here's where this kind of veers from the history. Historically, um, while certain forms of cotton like fustian were used in the creation of gambesons, usually you would be stuffing a looser sort of raw material in, so sheep's wool that hadn't been spun yet or horse hair like the picture of the gambeson I showed earlier would be stuffed in and you would want it to be pretty thick. Um, but because I am not anticipating any martial activities in my near future, since I am not at the moment a part of a reenactment society or a LARP, and this is going to be more of a winter coat for me. So I thought that quill batting would be the simplest modern solution as something a little bit more uniform um, and still quite warm and thick, but wouldn't require me to sort of stuff the panels of the gambeson as much. And if you want to see an example of this, um, Stitch in Time, hosted by Amber Butchart, they do a jupon jacket, which is very similar, but usually worn over. As you can see, this did get a bit fluffy um, after I unpacked it. Um, it started to come quite loose. But if you want to see them actually stuffing sort of raw wool in a gambeson, uh, Stitch in Time is a great show about historical clothing, and also uh, The Secrets of the Castle with Ruth Goodman. They show the making of a gambeson, and both of those sources were very inspirational for me. The lining of it is going to be this white-ish, because I washed it with something pink, linen tablecloth I found for $3 at a thrift store. Linen was a very popular fiber at the time, and many jackets would have been made out of linen or lined with linen. Some also, if you had the money for it, might have been leather on the exterior to just give even more protection against sharp implements and projectiles. So as I trace out the quadrants of my torso, I am adding a two inch border around the whole pattern. Now from A Stitch in Time and The Secrets of the Castle, which I will link below, I gathered that often in these cases, the, the stuffing sort of spreads as you're sewing. And so I have never worked with any sort of quilting or quilt batting before. And I wasn't sure if that would be an issue with this. So I left a nice border around all my pieces, and then I cut the front linen, which is this dark gray, and the inner linen with this larger border, and sandwiched it all together. As I started sewing, I realized that actually because I'm using a solid piece of batting, there wasn't that much spread, especially because I started anchoring the pieces by stitching around the outside and then sewing through the middle first instead of starting at one side. I reckoned that starting at one side would start to push the batting in one direction, so I wanted to kind of sew evenly on either side. And this method seemed to work. But I was pretty grateful to have this seam allowance, even though it was quite excessive. It made it a lot easier to assemble the panels and then have enough to fold over quite neatly and stitch down on the hem and on the inside. I also started using these large pins. I use them sometimes as veil pins, but they are actually uh, florist pins for bouquet. So they're extra long and they have this sort of pearl end. Because I was going through so many layers of linen and cotton batting, I needed a longer pin so that it wouldn't get lost in the panels. Okay, so I was trying to do this by hand. Um, but because I'm following the line on this side and trying to stitch through, it's coming out a little uneven, just a, not a lot, just a slight variance. It's hard for me to like keep the tension. And while I could put this piece in an embroidery hoop, the bigger pieces, it's, it's not going to work. I'm a little bit worried about the thickness, but I'm going to try to run it through my machine. I was very fortunate that my very basic, not at all heavy duty machine managed to get through all these layers of fabric. I did notice I had to sort of feed the fabric a little bit more. Normally you're just keeping the fabric straight, but in this case, as you can see, I'm gently tugging at the back to keep it feeding through the machine. If I didn't apply any of that pressure, it just kind of sat there and did the same stitch over and over and over again and make, made a huge 
tangle of bobbin thread and top thread. So once I had determined that, I could start assembling all the main body pieces. I spent many hours in front of my sewing machine bopping to ancient emo beats and getting through the many, many lines of quilting. It took quite a long time to draw them all out. This project was challenging to me because symmetrical, careful lines are not really my forte. I would always get in trouble for art class for not really being able to cut in a straight line. And here I was trying to make a series of perfectly straight lines. Some of them wiggle a little bit, I admit. Something I discovered actually, while I was pinning all these pieces, is that it actually does kind of deflect pointy objects. As you can see here, I can't really get the pin straight through. The batting kind of sticks out and presses on it and keeps it from penetrating fully that extra layer of linen. So while I'm not gonna be using this for getting hit by arrows, I can see how even this pared down version of it does give some protection. Once I got all the main pieces finished, I could start as assembling them to each other. And as I mentioned, having this extra large seam allowance, even though the fabric didn't need it, it didn't spread much, it helped. And as you can see, I do have gores in the side of this. And that is actually for a very practical reason. If you look at a lot of gambesons, you can see that many of them do have a slightly flared shape, either they're split in the back or they just angle outward so that men could move their legs more easily, ride horses. For me, the practical reason was, unlike most men, I have very, very large hips. So if this was a completely rectangular piece, it wouldn't be able to close over my hips quite simply. So this feature was very important to me, but as I mentioned, it was something you might have seen on some historical gambesons as well. Sometimes I feel like I will be cutting all the little threads from this for the rest of my life. There are a lot of different options for closures on this. You can have it just meet two square panels in the front, like many modern jackets, um, or some sort of overlap. There can be buttons, there can be frog closures, there can be buckles. So I decided to make it a little more visually interesting and also in a practical way to provide more protection around your heart. I would do an overlapping panel from the right side to the left at this sort of curved shape and I would have buckle closures on the throat and along the torso. So I decided to make it more visually interesting. I would also change the way this panel was quilted, going horizontally instead of vertically. Since it is a rather narrow panel overall as well, it just, it makes more visual sense and it adds a little bit of a nice feature, I think, to the front of the jacket. The next piece I needed was the collar. While I already had a neck measurement, I wanted to make sure that it would fit the neck of the garment as well. So I wanted a piece that also overlapped so it would cross over in the front again, providing extra throat protection. Since practically your throat is a pretty important area where you can get got quite easily. Um, so I wanted it to overlap so my throat would be completely contained and on a cold, windy kind of day it would also be quite warm. The collar is just two kind of uh, quilt bands wide and it just wraps all the way around. Again, I gave myself a nice border which does make it easier to finish off and it's gonna buckle at the side. 
So the quilting, having that quilt batting helps the collar to stand up so I didn't need to do any fancy tailoring techniques, it just works. And then I needed to take the time to start hand finishing these edges. I didn't want the hemming to show through to the other side so I'm just securing it to the inner lining of the fabric with a whip stitch. Then I needed to determine the exact locations of where I wanted these buckles to be. Now, of course, I kind of had planned it out originally when I drafted this, but I wanted to try it on my body first. I also feel like it looks pretty cute as just a vest, and I almost didn't put the sleeves on this, but I just had to follow through. So I ended up kind of debating whether I wanted a closure down at the bottom or not, because I figured having, again, that extra mobility would be useful. So I ended up only doing three buckles on the garment instead of four, but I can still go back and add a fourth at some point, should I change my mind on that subject. These buckles were labeled as being leather, but I have my doubts considering how easy it was to just push a standard needle through them. So they might be pleather, but I like the hooks. They're modern, but they have that sort of historical look to them. And I just felt like they would be more interesting than just standard buttons. Also, I wouldn't have to carve through all the layers of padding to make buttonholes. It just, it seemed quite complicated. So, Buckles it was, although a frog closure like in the horsehair gambeson I showed earlier would also be a cool option. Once their location was set, I started attaching these by hand. And what I ended up doing was making a simple row of stitches. Obviously you can't do like a running stitch or something against fabric that's so thick and maybe leather, maybe not. But I went through and went over it one time and then went back through the stitches a second time. So they're reinforced and I'm using double layer of thread as well. So it's actually four layers of thread through each stitch hole to keep these secured to the jacket, which hopefully will be sufficient. They're not going to be under terrible strain because I didn't make them super tight. There's some give and movement to them, which was also by design. And then it was finally sleeve or sleeveil time as sleeves are pretty evil as most of us know. I ended up using a pattern that already existed in my <laughs> repertoire for sleeves because the sleeves head was actually about the same size as the arms I ended up being for the jacket. I decided to try and do something a little more visually interesting with the quilting on the sleeve as well so I did the vertical quilting along the bottom of the sleeve but then down the shoulder I did horizontal and when I finished I looked at the sleeves and realized that they were not identical that I had an extra quilt line on one of them and so I held it up to the camera to be like oh can you believe this but honestly even in this shot you can't tell that much and once they're on the jacket I, I don't think anyone's gonna notice It shouldn't surprise anyone that there's a ton more thread trimming that needs to be done. But once I finish with that, the sleeves can be attached. And it was a little bit hard getting them in place correctly because it's hard to ease in such a thick padded sleeve. But I made a nice sleeve volcano. And then once that was all stitched in place and the cuffs and hem were done, the jacket was finished as well. I have to admit I'm pretty proud of myself. This was definitely something outside of my comfort zone, both in the style of assembly and also just in the fit. It's not feminine, it doesn't show off my waist very much, but 
I am, can still look at it and say, I did a good job. This looks the way it's supposed to and fits the way it's supposed to, even if it doesn't flatter me the way most garments are supposed to in the modern era. This is super warm and cozy. I'm gonna wear it camping. And if I ever get to do a winter reenactment, I'll wear it then too. So I'm very proud of myself. Thank you everyone for tuning in to this special video as part of Costume Symposium. I hope you check out the other videos and an extra special thanks to my patrons. Join their ranks by following the link in my description box. Bye!